What's up, everyone? Welcome to On The Market. I am your host, Dave Meyer, joined by Kathy Fecky. Kathy, how are you? Great. Happy to be here with you. Likewise, James is also here. James, what's going on? Oh, just hanging out in Seattle. It's, it's been weird. The weather in Seattle has been better than SoCal. <laughs> That's very unusual. Which is why I'm wearing a sweater. It's cold and overcast again. It's it's June gloom. I mean, you, you guys know this because we've been talking for a while, but it is so hot in my apartment that my camera has stopped working and so have my headphones and I'm just sweating profusely because I live in a five-story walk-up without air conditioning and it is hot as hell right <laughs> <laughs> they just don't believe in air conditioning in this continent i don't i ha- i even have one i ha- i bought like one of those little ones that you sneak out the window but it's too loud to run during the recording so i just have to sweat it out <laughs> well this will be a quick show then <laughs> yeah it's gonna be four minutes <laughs> dave's gonna have abs by the end of the show <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if I was like a high school wrestler, I would be sitting in this room for an hour to get down to my fighting weight. All right. Well, we do have a great show today. I'm really excited about this one. This is going to be really cool. So we, for the most of the show, what we're going to talk about is portfolio allocation. And we're not just talking about real estate. We're going to be talking about how Kathy, James, and myself all allocate our resources, our different capital funds that we have available into different asset classes. So We'll be talking about real estate, but we'll also be talking about, um, you know, crypto. We'll be talking about stock market. We'll be talking about lending um, and talking about why these make these decisions, how we think about building a portfolio that is uh, optimized for returns, but also takes into account our respective risk tolerances and all that. So I'm super excited to talk about that. Uh, And we're going to get into that in just a minute. But in the spirit of this show, talking about different assets, we're going to play a quick game to see how well the two of you track the value of different assets that aren't real estate. So this is not your area of expertise um, over the last couple of years. So do you guys track it? Do you think you're going to know these answers? Like what gold goes for, Bitcoin, that kind of stuff? I don't track it. I have an idea. All right. I have a tendency to lose money on everything except for real estate. So I don't really pay attention to it anymore. <laughs> I, I think that's, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. I want to get back to that. But so what what we're going to do for this game is you have to guess month over month in the last month, how much have these different assets moved up or down? So number one, James, I'm going to give this to you. Gold per ounce. How much has gold gone up in the last month? And we are talking, we we are recording this just so everyone knows in the middle of June. I'm guessing that gold went up like quarter percent. Kathy? I want to say a little bit higher because of all the insanity. So let's say 3%. It has actually gone down 2.3% gold. But you're both right that it's gone on a big run this year. Um, Gold has definitely seen its value go up, but perhaps as inflation has started to abate a little bit, uh, demand for gold is going down as well. What about Bitcoin, James? Where do you think Bitcoin's at? Do you like I'm not even gonna ask you percentage. What how much do you think one Bitcoin costs? Ooh, I know it went on a run. I think it's like around like twenty two grand right now, twenty three grand. And any guesses if it's gone up or down month over month? Uh well it went on a run and I think it went up like a good 10, 15 percent, but I think it's cooled back down. And so I'm guessing it's down three percent to four. If gold's down two, I bet you Bitcoin's down four. Okay. Kathy, what do you think? <laughs> I'm going to be so wrong. I'm going to say that Bitcoin's around 12,000 and that it's just sitting there doing nothing. No change. Well, Kathy, you are correct in that you are very wrong. Um, <laughs> it is, James, you were a lot closer. It is 26,000 for oh. Bitcoin. It was at around 60 grand at one point. Yes. Uh, but it's been in the, you know, the mid to uh, 20,000s for the last year or so. Uh, but it's down three and a half percent month over month. Uh, probably some of the same forces that are pushing gold down. Kathy, what about the S&P 500, one of the uh, best indexes to track the stock market? There's no rhyme or reason to the stock market these days, so I'm going to say it's up 5%. James, this is just in the last month. In the last month, I think it's down about 1.5%. All right, Kathy, you totally redeemed yourself. It is up 6% month over month. 
So there you have it. See, that's why I passed high school. I guessed well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you and me both. <laughs> so we see gold and Bitcoin both down a little bit. Stock market is up. And we are going to get into all these different asset classes and why we do or don't invest in them in just a minute. But first, we're going to take a quick break. All right, everyone, welcome back to our show on our investment portfolio allocation. We're going to talk a little bit now, just for, we're going to start the show by just having all three of us, we're going to run through rough percentages and how much of our total investments are in different asset classes like gold, crypto, income, you know, stocks, whatever. So James, let's start with you. How do you, you know, estimate your portfolio allocation right now? Um, so my portfolio, I actually I spent a lot of time looking at that every year. Basically, you know, for the first 10 years of our career, we saved a lot of cash. That was my whole thing. I had a really bad experience in 2008. And so when you go through a bad experience, you start to do things a lot in the opposite way to where, you know, I don't carry a lot of debt. I like to keep cash on hands and I like to be cash accessible because it was all locked up in 2008. So right now with my portfolio, I would say right now we have about 40% in holds, which are like apartment buildings. We have nearly a thousand doors in the Pacific Northwest. And that's where a lot of capital sits. I also leave a lot of my own personal rentals. Um, and then part of that will be towards uh, a primary house that we're going to be buying very soon uh, because we just sold one of ours. I keep Right now, I'm actually, of my total net worth, I stay about 25% in cash accessible investing. And that's in hard money space where I'm issuing out on short term. It's basically anything that yields above 10%. So it's it's a hard money notes, a joint venture flips, pat, more passive income where we're just providing the finance or I'm providing the financing for people. That has been one of the best ways I've been able to balance out my portfolio because like the reason I like to have that is that's constant income always coming in and it's less affected by market changes at that point. So when we went through this really kind of nasty time from July to December, I had no effect on me whatsoever because of that passive high yielding income. And so I like to keep it there because it helps service my payments, my costs. But then at the same time, you know, I have 25% of my total cash there, but we have probably 40% of the leftover cash in holdings. And then we keep another 20% roughly that goes back into our business because our business does short-term development, which is fix and flip development, which are high yield investments that we're, we're targeting like 30 to 40% returns annually on. And so I, I would say as an investor, I'm a very high risk investor, but we only invest in stuff that we know really well. Well, I, I mean, I think it's evident that you're a high risk investor. The fact that you call a short term loan, uh, like a hard money loan cash. <laughs> I think most people <laughs> would consider that an investment and not cash, but, um, it, it, that to you, if that's as good as cash, uh, you must be making some pretty good loans. <laughs> if you underwrite it right, it is cash. Or it, it's got cash with even better kicker because, you know, I look at those is they're paying me a high yield, you know, like my hard money income pays for 100% of my living expense plus some. And so everything else is a bonus to me that I can reinvest at that point. But I consider it as cash because I underwrite it correctly. And if honestly, if the loan goes bad, I'm probably going to make double what I would have made even being the lender. So I that's why I consider it cash. And when I'm looking at you, you know, James and Kathy both wrote out their portfolio allocations uh, before this. You say you estimate you you have one percent, a shocking one percent of your net worth in the stock market. Is that right? Yeah, that was kind of a rounding up thing. It's probably like a cool, <laughs> I, the, honestly, the, I have some money still sitting on a Tesla short that I just won't give up on, and I've yeah. totally gotten hammered on this thing. <laughs> I've lost more money on that deal than I've, uh, it, it has not gone good, but I, it's more just me hanging in there. You know, Kathy Wood just sold her Tesla stock and she was bullish. So you could be onto something here. Well, I unfortunately shorted it when it was like at 300 a share though. So I got, I got a long you got way to go. You got a long <laughs> way to go. All right. And crypto, you said 1%. So you're really real estate heavy, even if you're, it's in loans, if it's in your business, it's basically all in real estate. It is in real estate. It's what I know. It's what I understand. I am a person like to be in control of my own destiny. Like if if something goes wrong, I, I can get mad at myself. I don't like giving my capital and my investments over to a third party, like a company uh, subject to gold pricing. I want to be in control. And if something goes wrong, I want to be able to jump in and mitigate that, which is, you know, with real estate, if something's going wrong, I can switch the plan and it's my call. My hands are on it. 
if something goes wrong with Bitcoin, there's nothing I can do besides sell it on the way down. Yeah. And and so that's the real reason that I do it. I just believe in I, I believe that hard work can get you a long ways in life and you can work your way out of a hole. And that's why I love real estate. All right. What about you, Kathy? How do you allocate your resources? Oh, you know, so I this is one of those do as I say, not as I do moments. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the contractor that, that never finishes their own house. Uh, so I'm, I constantly preach diversification. I'm so non-diversified. It's, it's embarrassing. Yes. 70% in real estate. I put 5% in stocks and that's just not true. It's probably, yeah, it's probably closer to 1% and, <laughs> and rich, rich just plays on his phone. It's just more like a game. Um, bonds zero. And this is where I, I, you know, again, do as I say, not as I do. I, I have zero in bonds, and yet we have cash that's for reserves, and it really should be in something besides cash, and that could be, you know, short-term bonds. So, you know, zero in bonds, uh, commodities, we have gold, uh, that's mostly, people look at gold, or some people think it's an investment, and I don't agree at all. I think it's just an insurance policy, really, is is more of a, a backup in case the US dollar just becomes totally worthless someday. Of course, if it did, there would be a new currency in the US. It's not like the US is going to say, you know what, we just don't have a currency. So it's just more psychological of knowing that if everything fell apart, a few chunks of gold might might help during the zombie apocalypse or something. But I've never seen it as, a, as an investment. And um, crypto, Rich and I, had a big fight over this and he won. He just bought some crypto right at the peak and um, and we were holding it. But again, it's kind of just not an investment, more of the hedge, which I think a lot of people bought crypto for, again, thinking that maybe the currency would completely fail. Collectibles, nah. I mean, wine, if you're going to have wine, drink it. I, I don't understand that. I totally agree. Well, luxury watches. Those are collectibles. You know, not uh, probably, but no, I, I just like real estate. I, like you said, I understand it. I look at a, just a boring, boring hold of real estate. Well, we'll talk about that later, but cash, about 20% in cash. And again, it's not being used the way it should be. And that's really just comes down to being busy and lazy with it. So Rich and I got to sit down and really focus on, okay, what's the next way that we want to uh, you know, how do we want our portfolio to look? You could get, kind of have your head down doing the thing that you're doing for a long time and, and not look up and say, are we there? And this is, this is where we want to be. You, we, we sit down every year with our goals, uh, and we look at our portfolio, but I think it's time to just maybe look at alternative assets or see what a financial planner would say, which I haven't talked to one in 20 years. You know? <laughs> All right. Well, both of you are, are along the same lines and I do. What you know, we're going to get into how you allocate your real estate portfolio shortly because I'm curious, you know, how much of your, you know, real estate is in short term rentals or long term rentals or syndications or what. So we'll get into that in a minute. But I just have to, you know, give voice to the uh, reasonable amount of diversification crowd over here. And I, I consider myself like fairly heavy in real estate, I guess. Like I'd say that 60, 65% of my net worth is probably in real estate with about 25% in stocks and bonds. So to you guys, that probably sounds crazy, but I think to most people, the, the inverse sounds nuts. And I am holding probably about 15% in cash right now, which is more than I think like a financial advisor would tell you to. But uh, that's honestly just, again, like Kathy said, do, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, just trying to be opportunistic about the commercial real estate market and just holding holding a little bit more uh, dry powder than I normally would. But I guess I just I just feel like I worry about holding all of my money in a single asset class, even if it, I, I do believe real estate is the best uh, thing to invest in long term. I also just get FOMO. Like I just hear about the stock market. I'm like, I got to get in on that. You know, like some, <laughs> sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to miss opportunities if they go on some of these huge runs. So I, I think I'm probably a little bit more uh, diversified than either of you. FOMO gets me in trouble. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I just won't do it anymore. Bitcoin stocks, no way. I, that FOMO got me in deep trouble. Did you ever invest in stocks? 
Yeah, and it was terrible. I had a, a, T, a, a TD Ameritrade app, and it was like blackjack for me. It was like, it, it, like wake up at like one in the morning and making trades. So I was like, oh, I'm going to buy this. I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm too much of a trader. To hang <laughs> on. Now, I did crush it during COVID. But so did everyone. <laughs> I know. I thought I was really smart. And then I learned that I was not so smart whatsoever. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. I mean, I, I think picking, you know, being invested in the stock market, unless you're really going to learn it, you're you're better off just buying index funds and doing something extremely boring. Oh, with that said, I just have to tell you a quick story that one of my surf buddies uh, had gone through a divorce and he came to me and he's like, ah, after the divor- divorce, I probably have, I don't know, $50,000 left. And what should I do with it? And I'm like, oh, you know, there's not a lot of real estate you could buy with that unless you do the Jamil, uh, you know, type type investing. So he said, I talked to him a year later. I'm like, How, what did you end up doing? He goes, oh, I put it in Tesla. Now it's 500,000. Oh my God. <laughs> so so sometimes people pick it, pick the right stock. I, you know, obviously there's risk to it, but he timed it well. Oh, totally. I, I just, do you guys know the stock NVIDIA, the chip maker? Oh yeah. It's like single-handedly like leading the stock market rally right now. And a friend of mine told me to buy it. Like, you know, a year and a half ago, I bought a bunch of it. It's going crazy. Wow. Don't ask me about the other stocks I bought, but (laughs) (laughs) those are not even close. But this one right now, as of today, it's looking pretty good. So I'm going to brag about it. (laughs) Yeah. Good on you for getting that. Too late now. All right. So since both of you are really primarily invested almost entirely in real estate, Kathy, I know you do syndications, you have funds, like How do you allocate money within your real estate portfolio and how do you think about, you know, risk versus reward and different opportunities? Yeah, I haven't invested in other people's syndications yet. So that, that I look forward to doing. We just have our own and, you know, as a syndicator, you have to have money set aside to invest in your own or else people might question it. So. You know, if we, at some point we had about, I don't know, 15 syndications going. So, uh, that's where my money went. Any, any extra money, uh, with, I would say primarily it's just boring old buy and hold rental real estate. We have, uh, now short, three short term rentals, uh, percentage wise. I don't know. That's, that's gaining. That's gaining because we're looking at another one. Cause again, the tax benefits are so fantastic there. Uh, but the the bulk of it really is boring old buy and hold, which I love. So why why short term rentals? You mentioned the tax benefits, but are there other reasons you chose to diversify out of the traditional rentals and into short terms. Yeah, short term rentals were kind of an accident for us. We uh, we have a guest house, and we thought, well, let's just see, let's just put it on the market because we found that a lot of our nephews were just sort of camping out there. <laughs> so we thought, <laughs> why, don't we, why don't we put it on the market? And um, that was just more to see. And then we were absolutely blown away. It booked immediately. And of course, this was during COVID, uh, where a guest house was ideal because you didn't have anyone mm-hmm. near you. You know, you had your own air. So we uh, we were booked constantly. And then uh, we were like, well, this is amazing. Let's put another little unit on the property. And same thing. It it's So it's actually on our property. And we discovered it pays for those two little rentals pay for our entire housing situation, plus the gardeners, <laughs> which are expensive. So it's it was so great that we decided to do another one. And that one uh, has been definitely slower because at least in the area we're in, that one's in Park City. It's, uh, it's renting and it's paying for itself, but it's slower than I expected it would be. But we're still happy with it because that year one, you know, a lot of people are getting into short term, term rentals because there's just so many, so many deductions that first year. You get to deduct the cost of the furniture. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk tax stuff, but definitely bring a, a CPA on to talk about the sort of loophole there is right now with short term rentals. It's a fantastic way to get massive depreciation year one. So Kathy, we did bring on a CPA expert just to talk about that is episode 96 with Brandon Hall, where we talk about um, some of the tax benefits of owning a short-term rental. I knew that. I'm just kidding. I will of definitely <laughs> listen you to that. Listen to every episode. Uh, I know. I try. I try. I just missed that one somehow, and I can't wait. He actually, the <laughs> firm actually does the uh, accounting for our our single-family rental fund. So I love them. Oh yeah, they're awesome. So yeah. good. Yeah. 
Okay. So what about, you know, when you talk about diversification within real estate, you can consider it between strategies like short-term rental, long-term rental. What about geographic diversification? Because I know you invest in a couple of different markets. How does that factor into your planning? Absolutely. I'm bullish on uh, geographic diversification. That's why, that's what we've been teaching for years is you know, so many people, I started in California, right? So, so many people would own a $1 million property. Maybe they paid 300000 for it, but it's worth a million, but they're still getting maybe 2500 in rent per month. And, you know, and to try to get those people to understand, you know, to that that's not diversification. If there's a vacancy, you're 100% out of luck, you know, but if you took that million dollars and, and diversified it with five properties nationwide, if you have any problems with it, you've got four other ones to carry you like a, like a multifamily. So, and, and why not be in different markets where there's different jobs, you know, job centers. And if there's a recession, maybe one area would be affected, but the other one might not be. Of course, with climate change, you know, having that diversification is really important too. You don't know where the storm is going to hit. So you want to make sure that you've got some properties that won't be affected. So you do diversify. We found it. We found where you diversify, Kathy. All right. Yeah. But there was one year where I was just so embarrassed because I teach, 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 and then don't do. Uh, But we, we had a house on this, on a road. And then we were building another house on that same road. And then I had my office at the bottom of the road. And that was the year that the fires hit Malibu and came down that road. <laughs> so I'm looking wow. at my friends going, I cannot believe I teach diversification. I have three properties on one street where the fire's coming. Somehow all three properties were fine. It was a miracle. Wow. It really was because the homes next to it were burned. But uh, that is another reason why, like I said, with climate change or just with, you know, normal normal disasters that happen. I mean, we have, you know, I live in earthquake country. I wouldn't want a whole bunch of properties in LA or San Francisco on a fault line. And people do. Well, this is, this is really good. I'm, I'm glad we have the two of you here because I, you know, I think a lot about diversification in real estate and how to do it. And I think there's two schools of thought that people have. One is to sort of like stick with a single strategy um, and then diversify geographically. And that sounds like that's what Kathy's doing. But the other way of doing it is sort of picking one market and then diversifying between asset classes and different strategies, which James is basically what you do, right? Yeah, we. Um, I I am very diversified in my real estate portfolio. Um, it's I mean, hence why I have ninety eight percent of my funds in real estate. <laughs> uh, so, but it is spread out and it's spread out in all different types of uh, classes. I, I really learned this in 2008 to diversify what I was doing because in 2008, I was doing two things. I was only flipping homes and I was only buying uh, Burr properties that I could finance all my money out of. And what happened is when the market slowed down, the rent stopped paying for themselves, the values plummeted, all my cash, uh, I, I had financed and put too much debt on these properties and I was just sucking wind all the way around, right? The flip went bad, the rental went bad. And so what I've done, I, I do it. It's a little bit complex, but I keep a big, you know, I keep a chunk of money in hard money, short term notes that pay me passive income. That that is one uh, portfolio that I I put it in. I keep a big chunk of money in there because I want that to be cash accessible, and I feel like it's the lowest risk because the average note loan to value that I'm lending on is fifty five percent loan to value, and I'm making a twelve percent yield on that money. And so if the whole if the wheels come off and the market crashes, I'm still in a very good protected position and I have access, I have access to cash. So if the market does fall apart and crashes, then I can pull it out and go buy up as much as I want. Because one thing is I didn't have enough cash in 2008 and I wish I would have had it sitting there because I would have I'd be I, I would not be working right now. If that would have been the case. So why, James, why, when you were choosing to diversify, why did you choose to stick basically with one city, one location, um, and not basically not diversify geographically, but instead to sort of stick to one area, but diversify the types of deals that you do in that one area? Uh, it's for mitigation of risk. I have resources, access to resources, and I understand the market 
the Seattle market better than I understand any other market in the United States. When you have access to resources and you have abilities to get things completed, it reduces the risk on a market. Now, if I'm lending money in a di- different state or I'm buying properties in a different state and I don't have the same resources that I have in Washington, that's a riskier investment for me. Because if for some reason I need to take control of that asset and reposition it, if I don't have the skill set or the tools or the resources, that asset can go really bad, right? We see that happen with investors all the time. They buy something they don't know. What they bought was a good investment, but they didn't know how to execute on it, and it turned into a very poor investment. So the fact that I can execute on things reduces my risk dramatically. So I can get like a high yield with a lower risk, in my opinion. So I want to, you know, this is basically how you guys are allocating resources now. But let's, I want to just turn to like what you recommend to other investors. If you were getting started today, Kathy, how would you, let's just assign a a random amount of money. Let's say you had $100,000 today. How would you allocate that if you were a new investor? Mm, Such a good question. Um, So much would depend on what the goal is of that person and the age. You know, we talked about diversification and risk tolerance. As I as I get older, I'm way more conservative and I want to be way more diversified and take less risk. But when you're young, you know, it's okay to take a little more risk. So if, if, if let's just say that it's a 30 year old couple that just got a hundred thousand dollar bonus and they're trying to build, maybe they're, I mean, my first step would be get a fourplex or something that you live in because you could put so little down if you're willing to, kind of be uncomfortable for a little while, get an FHA loan, put 3% down and get a fourplex and rent out the other units. You don't have to live in that forever and you wouldn't have to use very much of that 100,000. But let's say you already have your house, that's not the issue. Uh, Then I would probably, again, depending on your time, I would, if I had extra time or a spouse who's not working, I probably would study the sub two, the subject to um, not having to use that money or financing, having that money just as reserves, but being able to acquire properties with no money down. That's how I started with no money down deals. But that's because we could do 100% financing back then. So that would that would be something I would study if, if I had time. If I didn't have time, I had a full-time job and just needed to invest, I would go into the areas, like I've said, that that are on that list of highest job growth, uh, highest population growth, but still the average person can afford the average rent in the area, which, you know, are the areas that we're in. Dallas, I like Salt Lake, I love Tampa. Indianapolis has been a really strong market. P- parts of Ohio, um, you know, in the, in the, in the parts of Ohio where it's growing. So that's, you, you wouldn't be able to buy a lot, but if you were able to, get into a growth area, it wouldn't take too long to be able to refi, get your money out. Again, if you don't have the time to to do the work and, you know, find an old property, fix it up and create your own equity, uh, then if you're in a growth market, it won't be long before there likely is equity and you can refi and go do it again. It's good advice. But again, like, like I said, it's, it's so different for everybody. Everybody's circumstances are different. Well, James, what if it were you? If you had a hundred thousand to invest right now, what asset class would you put it into? Oh, I mean, for me, it's a no-brainer. I, I, it would be development or fix and flip. That is going to get you the highest possible cash on cash return. It's going to get you the most growth in that first year. You know, for me, I'm trying to get to my end goal with passive income. You need liquidity. You need money to be able to get you that right amount of passive income, right? The bigger your pond or your pool of money, the bigger your returns can be and the more income you can get. But that's how you 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 really change. Fix and flip can earn me 40 to 50% returns on my money in that first year. That 100 can turn into 150. And then the 150 can turn into almost, uh, it's going to turn into 210 at that point, 220. I can, I can domino affect that and then start repositioning it. But after you get it up a little bit, then you want to start balancing it out. That's what we've done with our portfolios. We always have, you know, I have 15%, if, if I had a hundred grand and I wanted to balance it out, I would do 15% in hard money. That's a short term six month note that's paying me a high yield. I then would buy apartments with another 20% of that. Because I like apartments, they're efficient, they're stable, uh, they have growth, especially in our Seattle market, the rents are strong, population's growing, that's going up. 
The third thing I do is I hedge against what I do at my business and I would I would take another 10% and I go buy small properties, two to four units that hedge against my larger properties. So I like to balance out my portfolio. I don't believe in buying just one asset class with rental properties. I think you need to be in two tiers because typically multifamily and single family swing a little bit different. Saying that right now, for sure. Yeah, and it balances you out. And, and so like at our company, we own about a thousand doors. I own that with my business partner. That's all company funds. What I buy personally is a complete hedge against that. Everything I own is below 10 units and they're small and they're value add and, and they're more equity position plays because the, the my big portfolios give me the cash flow. My small ones give me the equity that I'm going to trade for more cash flow later. And then Another 30% we put in high yield investments, which is your development, your fix and flip that are going to get us 40, 50% growth is higher risk, but the growth is potentially there. That keeps that growing to keep putting money in those other buckets. And so uh, I like to spread it out, you know, and then the last little 10%, I do syndicating myself just to get the tax break. But I think, you know, if you, if you have a hundred grand, you should break it into different buckets and let the buckets grow themselves. And then you'll become a lot more balanced and less susceptible to risk. I so agree with everything you're saying. There's just, unfor- you know, there's people that just literally can't do that. They're maybe professional athletes or they're actors or they're, they're attorneys, dentists. They, they just can't, they don't have the time to, to develop anything or flip anything. That's why I, I love, I'd love to just use some really boring numbers here. Let's say a $250,000 rental property. To me, that's on the high side. I like to stay under 200 when I can. It's harder to do these days. Uh, but if it just, if that property just went up 5%, and let's just take Tampa, that's an area that this last year, one of the hardest times to be in real estate, uh, it did go up 5%. That value on a $250,000 property is, it's gone up $12,000. And all you did was nothing. And, and so, but if you look at the down payment, the percentage, the cash on cash return. So let's say you had to put $50,000 down to get this $250,000 property. You're making a 25% return on the cash you invested. And this is not including the cash flow that you're getting or the, the loan pay down or the, the tax benefits. That's not even including that. Just on a 5% increase in a $250,000 property, the cash on cash return is going to be really high. So, you know, again, there's just a hundred percent, James, if, if people have the time and the energy and the ability to flip and develop, that's where you're going to make your money. But if you don't just get in the game, you know, just buy a good property and let it grow for you. Yeah. That I, I, I think that's a very safe strategy. You know, I, I think I hear Kathy, your approach is a little bit safer, but you know, risk and re- return are, are related. And so you're probably not eligible for the sort of types of returns that James is talking about yeah. if you're doing development. It's riskier, but you can grow that capital faster. And as James said, he's he's a bit more comfortable with risk than probably the average person. James, I'm curious, you know, given the market conditions, would you still recommend development and flipping to people? Uh, yeah, because there's always buys. Even newbies, I should ask. Yeah. And there's there's always buys out there. We've seen better buys. Like, you know, we, we've been, I've been talking a lot about how Seattle's market's rebounding and it is. And if, if you, you know, when people got nervous and they sat on the sidelines, they missed a huge opportunity to make some serious wealth. Like, I mean, if someone would have bought six months ago on some of these fix and flip properties, they're going to make a hundred grand more than they were performing. That's a huge liquidity increase for people. But it comes down to risk in the market. We had a lot more cash in the development in the fix and flip market the last three years because rates were so low. We really believed in that section. As the market changes around, we're moving the money around. That's why I'm sitting so heavy with hard money notes right now. Because, you know, that's why I take my portfolio and based on what's going on in the market, because every market changes, there's different opportunities for every market. We are, that pie chart is going to change for my allocations at that point. Like we were allocating 10% or 20% for single family a couple years ago because I saw the growth there. Now I'm buying way less because it's harder to cash flow it right now. But the apartments we've allocated more cash to because we're seeing better deal flow. So you got to move around your money too if you really want to spread it out to wherever the opportunity is. Every market will have a different opportunity, but you got to adjust your investing principles at that point. Kathy, with a hundred grand, do you think you could diversify? Like if you had to do it, would you take, you know, like you said, if you 
bought a $200,000 property, put 25% down, you might be able to buy two properties ish. Um, would you buy it in two separate places or in one geography in today's market? I think with two properties, it doesn't matter if you find one market that you really like and you you like that you trust the property management company and you see the the job and population growth. I, th- I think it's okay to have two properties in one area. Uh, having one property in two different cities, it, it just takes more work, right? Now you have to find two really good property management companies and build teams in two areas. So, you know, just starting out, I think if you just hone in on a market that has all the things you need and want, then why not get both there? You're not div- diversified. Obviously, if diversification is really important and you're older, then I would maybe split it up. If you're younger, I wouldn't worry about it too much. You have time. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, if it were up to me, I, I think I would probably follow your your advice a little bit more, Kathy. I think buying a, a multifamily, a small multifamily is a really good balance of risk and reward um, in almost any market. Um, and people are always like, oh, you'd be uncomfortable for a few years. I've done it. It's really not that bad. Like, yeah, <laughs> in a property, people like make it out like it's gonna be this horrible situation. It's honestly fine. Yeah. I mean, that's how we started. We bought a house that was really big, too big for us. But I, I could see that it had an in-law suite and then it had another little section. So we we turned it into a triplex. And same thing, we're still doing it today, house hacking in a way. And it wasn't uncomfortable. In fact, we had friends living there and they brought their kids and we were like one big happy commune where our kids would play together, but we had separate areas. It was it was great. That sounds nice. I want to grow <laughs> up there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I'm just going to say one last thing about resource allocation that I think I've mentioned on a few uh, podcasts. I can't remember if it's on on the market or somewhere else, but um, I think it's a little bit uh, controversial with the real estate crowd. But I do think for the first time in my real estate investing career, and for probably 15 years at least, there are reasonable ways to get cash flow outside of real estate. And I know this sounds boring, but you can get 5% on a government bond right now. And I think it's like a really interesting uh, competition for uh, real estate. If you look at cap rates, for example, um, for multifamily, it's around 5%. And so you're getting the same amount of cash flow on a multifamily property, which has a lot more risk than a, at a government bond. And you know that's probably going to obviously push down multifamily prices because that can't last. Um, but I do think it's a reasonable thing for people to keep some money in a savings account or a bond uh, portfolio for the first time in a long time, especially if you're risk averse. Um, you know, if you had a hundred grand and you wanted to invest fifty of it into a rental property like Kathy was talking about, or into a flip, and keep some money in, uh, you know, a very safe, almost risk-free asset. It's not a bad idea. Uh, we're seeing inflation is coming down for the first time in a long time. Bond yields and risk-free assets might be offering a positive return over inflation. So it's just something to consider if you are a relatively risk-averse person. I'm not saying you should do that. You know, I still think you should buy real estate and get into the game. But if you're worried about putting all your money into, into a single asset class, there are relatively safe ways to actually earn a uh, inflation-adjusted return right now. And it's something maybe you should consider. If you're old. Yeah, if you think I'm crazy, obviously. If you're old, no, really, like playing it safe when you're older is really important. It's really, you don't want to start over when you're 60. And I, and I've seen people do it. I sure don't want to. Uh, but if, if that same person were young and, and really could, did the research and bought a property in an area where there's so much demand for rentals, you have a good property manager, the difference would be $25,000 in equity gain at a 5% increase at a 5% appreciation rate, they'd have $25,000 if they bought two properties versus a $5,000 uh, gain in bonds. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you're only getting cash flow. They don't, they don't appreciate, I mean, they can't appreciate, but um, they, they don't appreciate like real estate. I just think that when you look at the market, a lot of people are nervous. And I still think that buying real estate makes the most sense. That's what I do. But for years, we we're in this situation where like you couldn't be patient, you know, like you had to invest your money because inflation was eating away at your cash in the bank. And that dynamic is changing. And that's sort of all I mean is that like I feel more comfortable personally holding cash in the form of bonds right now and waiting to see what happens in the commercial real estate market because my money's not losing value in the bank in the same way that it was a year ago or two years ago. And it allows you to be just like a little bit more patient. 
um, than I felt like two years ago when you're just seeing your money yeah. to decrease in value by 10% just sitting in the bank. You know what I mean? Yep. Guilty of that for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, any last thoughts from either of you on uh, portfolio allocation or advice to our listeners? The one thing I would say is like what I just talked about, that's built off a plan that started with building income first, and then we adjusted that plan in. And, you know, I would think the only thing I really want to emphasize to newer investors, especially ones that have been making money the last two years, is save your money and create a plan for it. Because the money comes in, but it goes just as fast. And if you don't set that plan up and put yourself on a disciplined schedule of acquiring real estate or investing that money, it's going to blow up in smoke. So just make sure you put a plan together. If you're making money, plan it out. You don't want to be looking down the road in five years and be like, man, what happened to all the money I made? It's gone. Like Toys are great, but assets are better. James, you're going to love my new book. Is that what it's called? No, it's just all about like financial planning for real estate investors. But that doesn't come out until the fall, so hopefully all of you buy it and James maybe you'll get a maybe you'll get a pre-read write a little blurb for me. I'm 100% in. I love your last book. I that it I just getting <laughs> passed around my office is sales training. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah. I've got about 100 of them if you want some extra copy. Oh, I got I got my own share that we're passing around. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you both so much for joining. I appreciate you sharing all this information about how you think about risk, reward, and balancing your portfolio. If people have questions for you, Kathy, where should they reach out? You can find me at realwealth.com. That's our website. That's our company. And you can join there for free or on Instagram at, at Kathy Fetke. And James, what about you? Probably best ways on Instagram at jdaneflips or jamesdaner.com. All right. And I am at the Data Deli on Instagram, or you can always find me on Bigger Pockets as well. Thank you all so much for listening. We appreciate you all. And we'll see you next time for On the Market. On the Market is created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kaylin Bennett. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Joel Esparza and Onyx Media. Research by Pooja Jindal. Copywriting by Nate Weintraub. And a very special thanks to the entire Bigger Pockets team. The content on the show on the market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies.